Newscast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on Instagram at snoozecast to find behind the scenes content. If you enjoy our show, please write a review on the Apple Podcasts app. Please know that we read and appreciate every single one. Here's a recent review we loved. The subject line is thoroughly enchanting. And it goes, Not only do the soothing voices of the snoozecast narrators usher you straight into dreamland, but the classic stories they tell are a revelation. So many of the tales I thought I knew, but really didn't. I often listen to entire podcasts while fully awake and sitting up the next day. I guarantee you won't stay awake until the end, of the enchanting snoozecast stories while listening prone and under your covers. I love snoozecast. Thank you so much, Donna, for writing this review. We're glad you enjoy snoozecast, and we can't help but smile reading this. If you'd like to get an email once a week with upcoming sleep stories and other news, subscribe to this newsletter at snoozecast.com. This episode is dedicated to our listener and patron, Gayla, who suggested this story. Thank you, Gayla. This episode is brought to you by Marigolds in Jam Jars. Tonight, we'll read the opening to The Enchanted Castle, a children's fantasy novel by Edith Nesbitt, published in 1907. The Enchanted Castle of the title is an English country estate seen through the eyes of three children, Jerry, Jimmy, and Kathy. They discover it while exploring during the school holidays. The lake, groves, and marble statues, with white towers and turrets in the distance, make a fairy tale setting. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Enchanted Castle, Chapter 1. There were three of them Jerry, Jimmy, and Kathleen. Of course, Jerry's name was Gerald, not Jeremiah, whatever you may think. And Jimmy's name was James. And Kathleen was never called by her name at all, but Kathy, or Caddy, or Puscat when her brothers were pleased with her, and Scratch Cat when they were not pleased. And they were at school in a little town in the west of England. The boys at one school, of course, and the girls at another, because the sensible habit of having boys and girls at the same school is not yet as common as I hope it will be some day. They used to see each other on Saturdays and Sundays at the house of a kind maiden lady, but it was one of those houses where it is impossible to play. You know the kind of house, don't you? There's a sort of something about that kind of house that makes you hardly able even to talk to each other when you're left alone, and playing seems unnatural 
and affected. So, they look forward to the holidays, when they should all go home and be together all day long, in a house where playing was natural and conversation possible, and where the Hampshire forests and fields were full of interesting things to do and see. Their cousin, Betty, was to be there too, and there were plans. Betty's school broke up before theirs, and she got to the Hampshire house first. And the moment she got there, she began to have measles, so that my three couldn't go home at all. You may imagine their feelings. The thought of seven weeks at Miss Hervey's was not to be born, and all three wrote home and said so. This astonished their parents very much, because they had always thought it was so nice for the children to have dear Miss Hervey's to go to. However, they were jolly decent about it, as Jerry said, and after a lot of letters and telegrams, it was arranged that the boys should go and stay at Kathleen's school, where there were now no girls left and no mistresses except the French one. It'll be better than being at Miss Hervey's, said Kathleen, when the boys came round to ask Mademoiselle when it would be convenient for them to come. And besides, our school's not half so ugly as yours. We do have tablecloths on the tables and curtains at the windows, and yours is all deal boards and desks and inkiness. When they had gone to pack their boxes, Kathleen made all the rooms as pretty as she could, with flowers and jam jars, marigolds chiefly, because there was nothing much else in the back garden. There were geraniums in the front garden, and lobelias, of course. The children were not allowed to pick these. We ought to have some sort of play to keep us going through the holidays, said Kathleen, when tea was over, and she had unpacked and arranged the boys' clothes in the painted chest of drawers, feeling very grown up and careful as she neatly laid the different sorts of clothes in tidy little heaps in the drawers. Suppose we write a book. You couldn't, said Jimmy. I didn't mean me, of course, said Kathleen, a little injured. I meant us. Nah, said Gerald briefly. If we wrote a book, Kathleen persisted, about what the insides of schools really are like, people would read it and say how clever we were. More likely expel us, said Gerald. No, we'll have an out-of-doors game, bandits, or something like that. It wouldn't be bad if we could get a cave and keep stores in it and have our meals there. There aren't any caves, said Jimmy, who was fond of contradicting everyone. Besides, your precious mamselle won't let us go out alone, as likely as not. Oh, we'll see about that, said Gerald. I'll go and talk to her like a father. Like that? Kathleen pointed the thumb of scorn at him, and he looked in the glass. To brush his hair and his clothes and to wash his face and hands was to our hero but the work of a moment, 
said Gerald, and went to suit the action to the word. It was a very sleek boy, brown and thin and interesting looking, that knocked at the door of the parlor where Mademoiselle sat reading a yellow covered book and wishing vain wishes. Gerald could always make himself look interesting at a moment's notice, a very useful accomplishment in dealing with strange grown-ups. It was done by opening his gray eyes rather wide, allowing the corners of his mouth to droop and assuming a gentle, pleading expression resembling that of the late little Lord Fauntleroy, who must, by the way, be quite old now and quite awful. Entre, said Mademoiselle, in shrill French accents. So he entered. Et bien, she said, rather impatiently. I hope I'm not disturbing you, said Gerald, in whose mouth it seemed butter would not have melted. But no, she said, somewhat softened. What is it that you desire? I thought I ought to come and say how do you do, said Gerald because of you being the lady of the house. He held out the newly washed hand, still damp and red. She took it. You are a very polite little boy, she said. Not at all, said Gerald, more polite than ever. I am so sorry for you. It must be dreadful to have us to look after in the holidays. But not at all, said Mademoiselle in her turn. I'm sure you will be very good children's. Gerald's look assured her that he and the others would be as near angels as children could be without ceasing to be human. We'll try, he said earnestly. Can one do anything for you? asked the French governess kindly. Oh no, thank you, said Gerald. We don't want to give you any trouble at all. And I was thinking it would be less trouble for you we were to go out into the woods all day tomorrow, take our dinner with us, something cold, you know, so as not to be trouble to the cook. You are very considerate, said Mademoiselle coldly. Then Gerald's eyes smiled. They had a trick of doing this when his lips were quite serious. Mademoiselle caught the twinkle, and she laughed, and Gerald laughed too. Little deceiver, she said, why not say at once you want to be free of surveillance? How you say, overwatching, without pretending it is me you wish to please? You have to be careful with grown-ups, said Gerald. But it isn't all pretense either. We don't want to trouble you. And we don't want to... To trouble you, Apien. Your parents, they permit these days at woods? Oh, yes, said Gerald truthfully. Then... I will not be more a dragon than your parents. I will forewarn the cook. Are you content? Rather, 
said Gerald. Mademoiselle, you are a dear. A dear? she repeated. A stag? No, a... a chéri, said Gerald. A regular A1 chéri, and you shan't repent it. Is there anything we can do for you? Wind your wool or find your spectacles or... He thinks me a grandmother, said Mademoiselle, laughing more than ever. Go then, and be not more naughty than you must. Well, what luck? the others asked. It's all right, said Gerald, indifferently. I told you it would be. The ingenious youth won the regard of the foreign governess, who in her youth had been the beauty of her humble village. I don't believe she ever was. She's too stern, said Kathleen. Ah, said Gerald. That's only because you don't know how to manage her. She wasn't stern with me. I say, what a humbug you are, though, aren't you? said Jimmy. No, I'm a dip... what's its name? Something like an ambassador. Dipsoplomatist. That's what I am. Anyhow, we've got our day, and if we don't find a cave in it, my name's not Jack Robinson. Mademoiselle, less stern than Kathleen had ever seen her, presided at supper, which was bread and treacle spread several hours before, and now harder and drier than any other food you can think of. Gerald was very polite in handing her butter and cheese and pressing her to taste the bread and treacle. Bah! It's like sand in the mouth of a dryness. Is it possible this pleases you? No, said Gerald. It is not possible, but it is not polite for boys to make remarks about their food. She laughed, but there was no more dried bread and treacle for supper after that. How do you do it? Kathleen whispered admiringly as they said good night. Oh, it's quite easy when you've once got a grown-up to see what you're after. You'll see. I shall drive her with a rain of darning cotton after this. Next morning, Gerald got up early and gathered a little bunch of pink carnations from a plant which he found hidden among the marigolds. He tied it up with black cotton and laid it on Mademoiselle's plate. She smiled and looked quite handsome as she stuck the flowers in her belt. Do you think it's quite decent? Jimmy asked later, sort of bribing people to let you do as you like with flowers and things and passing them salt. It's not that, said Kathleen suddenly. I know what Gerald means, only I never think of the things in time myself. You see, if you want grown-ups to be nice to you, the least you can do is to be nice to them and think of little things to please them. I never think of any myself. Jerry does. That's why all the old ladies like him. It's not bribery. It's a sort of honesty. Like paying for things. Well, anyway, said Jimmy, putting away the moral question. We've got a ripping day for the woods. They had. The wide high street, even at the busy morning hour, almost as quiet 
as a dream street, lay bathed in sunshine. The leaves shone fresh from last night's rain, but the road was dry, and in the sunshine, the very dust of it sparkled like diamonds. The beautiful old houses, standing stout and strong, looked as though they were basking in the sunshine and enjoying it. But are there any woods? asked Kathleen as they passed the marketplace. It doesn't much matter about woods, said Gerald dreamily. We're sure to find something. One of the chaps told me his father said when he was a boy, there used to be a little cave under the bank in a lane near Salisbury Road. But he said there was an enchanted castle there too. So perhaps the cave isn't true either. If we were to get horns, said Kathleen, and to blow them very hard all the way, we might find a magic castle. If you've got the money to throw away on horns, said Jimmy contemptuously. Well, I have, as it happens, so there, said Kathleen. And the horns were bought in a tiny shop with a bulging window full of a tangle of toys and sweets and cucumbers and sour apples. And the quiet square at the end of the town were the churches and the houses of the most respectable people echoed to the sound of horns blown long and loud. But none of the houses turned into enchanted castles. So they went along the Salisbury Road, which was very hot and dusty. So they agreed to drink one of the bottles of ginger beer we might as well carry the ginger beer inside us as inside the bottle, said Jimmy. We can hide the bottle and call for it as we come back. Presently, they came to a place where the road, as Gerald said, went two ways at once. That looks like adventures said Kathleen, and they took the right-hand road. And the next time they took a turning, it was a left-hand one. So as to be quite fair, Jimmy said, and then a right-hand one, and then a left, and then another right-hand, and then a left and so on, till they were completely lost. Completely, said Kathleen. How jolly. And now, trees arched overhead, and the banks of the road were high and bushy. The adventurers had long since ceased to blow their horns. It was too tiring to go on doing that when there was no one to be annoyed by it. Oh, crikey, observed Jimmy suddenly. Let's sit down a bit and have some of our dinner. We might call it lunch, you know, he added persuasively. So they sat down in the hedge and ate the ripe red gooseberries that were to have been 
their dessert. And as they sat and rested and wished that their boots did not feel so full of feet, Gerald leaned back against the bushes, and the bushes gave way so that he almost fell over backward. Something had yielded to the pressure of his back, and there was the sound of something heavy that fell. Oh, Jiminy, he remarked, recovering himself suddenly. There's something hollow in there. The stone I was leaning against simply went. I wish it was a cave, said Jimmy. Of course it isn't. If we blow the horns, perhaps it will be, said Kathleen, and hastily blew her own. Gerald reached his hand through the bushes. I can't feel anything but air, he said. It's just a hole full of emptiness. The other two pulled back the bushes. There certainly was a hole in the bank. I'm going to go in, observed Gerald. Oh, don't, said his sister. I wish you wouldn't. Suppose there were snakes. Not likely, said Gerald but he leaned forward and struck a match. It is a cave, he cried, and put his knee on the mossy stone he had been sitting on, scrambled over it, and disappeared. A breathless pause followed. You all right? asked Jimmy. Yes, come on. You'd better come feet first. There's a bit of a drop. I'll go next, said Kathleen, and went, feet first, as advised. The feet waved wildly in the air. Look out said Gerald in the dark. You'll have my eye out. Put your feet down, girl, not up. It's no use trying to fly here. There's no room. He helped her by pulling her feet forcibly down and then lifting her under the arms. She felt rustling dry leaves under her boots and stood ready to receive Jimmy, who came in head first, like one diving into an unknown sea. It is a cave, said Kathleen. The young explorers, explained Gerald, blocking up the hole of the entrance with his shoulders dazzled at first by the darkness of the cave, could see nothing. Darkness doesn't dazzle, said Jimmy. I wish we'd got a candle, said Kathleen. Yes, it does, Gerald contradicted. Could see nothing, but their dauntless leader whose eyes had grown used to the dark, while the clumsy forms of the others were up at the entrance, fumbling, had made a discovery. Oh, what? Both the others were used to Gerald's way of telling a story while he acted it. 
but they did sometimes wish that he didn't talk quite so long and so like a book in moments of excitement. He did not reveal the dread secret to his faithful followers till one and all had given him their word of honor to be calm. We'll be calm, all right, said Jimmy impatiently. Well then, said Gerald, ceasing suddenly to be a book and becoming a boy. There's a light over there. Look behind you. They looked, and there was a faint grayness on the brown walls of the cave, and a brighter grayness cut off sharply by a dark line showed that round a turning or angle of the cave there was daylight. Attention, said Gerald, at least, that was what he meant, though what he said was shun, as becomes the son of a soldier. The others mechanically obeyed. You will remain at attention till I give the word slow march on which you will advance cautiously in open order following your hero leader taking care not to tread on the dead or wounded I wish you wouldn't said Kathleen there aren't any said Jimmy feeling for her hand in the dark. He only means take care not to tumble over stones and things. Here he found her hand, and she screamed. It's only me, said Jimmy. I thought you'd like me to hold it. You're just like a girl. Their eyes had now begun to get accustomed to the darkness, and all could see that they were in a rough stone cave that went straight on for about three or four yards and then turned sharply to the right. Death or victory? remarked Gerald. Now then, slow march. He advanced carefully, picking his way among the loose earth and stones that were the floor of the cave. A sail, a sail, he cried as he turned the corner. How splendid! Kathleen drew a long breath as she came out into the sunshine. I don't see any sail, said Jimmy, following. The narrow passage ended in a round arch, all fringed with ferns and creepers. They passed through the arch into a deep, narrow gully whose banks were of stones, moss-covered, and in the crannies grew more ferns and long, grasses, trees growing on the top of the bank arched across, 
and the sunlight came through in changing patches of brightness, turning the gully to a roofed corridor of goldy green. The path, which was of greeny gray flagstones, where heaps of leaves had drifted, sloped steeply down, and at the end of it was another round arch, quite dark inside, above which rose rocks and grass and bushes. It's like the outside of a railway tunnel, said James. It's the entrance to the enchanted castle, said Kathleen. Let's blow the horns. Dry up, said Gerald. The bold captain, reproving the silly chatter of his subordinates, I like that, said Jimmy, indignant. I thought you would, resumed Gerald. Of his subordinates, bade them advance with caution and in silence, because after all, there might be somebody about, and the other arch might be an ice house or something dangerous. What? asked Kathleen anxiously. Bears, perhaps, said Gerald briefly. There aren't any bears without bars in England anyway, said Jimmy. They call bears bars. In America, he added absently. Quick march was Gerald's only reply. And they marched. Under the drifted damp leaves, the path was firm and stony to their shuffling feet. At the dark arch, they stopped. There are steps down, said Jimmy. It is an ice house, said Gerald. Don't let's, said Kathleen. Our hero, said Gerald, who nothing could dismay raised the faltering hopes of his abject minions by saying that he was jolly well going on and they could do as they liked about it. If you call names, said Jimmy, you can go on by yourself, he added. So there. It's part of the game, silly explained Gerald kindly. You can be captain tomorrow, so you'd better hold your jaw now and begin to think about what names you'll call us when it's your turn. Very slowly and carefully, they went down the steps. A vaulted stone arched over their heads. Gerald struck a match when the last step was found to have no edge and to be, in fact, the beginning of a passage turning to the left. This, said Jimmy, will take us back into the road or under it, said Gerald. We've come down 11 steps. 
they went on, following their leader, who went very slowly for fear, as he explained, of steps. The passage was very dark. I don't half like it, whispered Jimmy. Then came a glimmer of daylight that grew and grew and presently ended in another arch that looked out over a scene so like a picture out of a book about Italy that everyone's breath was taken away and they simply walked forward, silent and staring. A short avenue of cypresses led, widening as it went, to a marble terrace that lay broad and white in the sunlight. The children blinking, leaned their arms on the broad, flat balustrade and gazed. Immediately below them was a lake, just like a lake in The Beauties of Italy. A lake with swans and an island and weeping willows. Beyond it were green slopes dotted with groves of trees. And amid the trees gleamed the white limbs of statues. Against a little hill to the left was a round white building with pillars, and to the right, a waterfall came tumbling down among mossy stones to splash into the lake. Steps led from the terrace to the water, and other steps to the green lawns beside it. Away across the grassy slopes, deer were feeding. And in the distance were the groves of trees thickened into what looked almost a forest were enormous shapes of gray stone like nothing that the children had ever seen before. It is an enchanted castle, said Kathleen. I don't see any castle said Jimmy. What do you call that, then? Gerald pointed to where, beyond a belt of lime trees, white turrets and towers broke the blue of the sky.